Hi, my name is Jenny Holroyd, and I'm here to talk to you about mitigating safety risk in a time of pandemic. We're going to go over some guidance on preparing for workplaces for COVID-19. A little bit about myself. I am a certified industrial hygienist, and I have a bachelor's degree in public health from Stockton University. I also have a master's of science in public health from Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in both environmental health and epidemiology. And I'm currently working on my DRPH as a student at UGA Schools of School of Public Health in their public health policy and management program. I also have experience working at the local level at a health department and also working at an outbreak lab at the CDC. So let's go over what you can do and what we're going to cover today. First off, we're going to take a look at all the steps that employers can take to reduce workers' risk of exposure to COVID-19. We're also going to talk about ways that you can manage surface de decontamination, how to implement workplace controls and safe work practices. And that's going to include talking about PPE for employees and what's available, and also how to safely switch to an alternate type if the type that you normally use isn't available because of um, limitations in the workplace or limitations of getting access to it. We're also going to talk about important considerations for creating an infectious disease outbreak response plan, long-term planning for employee safety. And then we're going to talk about how to disinfect an office or factory when a worker contracts COVID-19 policies and procedures that can assist with the prompt identification and isolation of somebody who becomes sick, what the OSHA record keeping requirements are and what to do if an employee tests positive for COVID-19. So how is this outbreak potentially affecting your business, any business, all businesses in the US? First, you may have already started seeing it, but when we speak to companies more and more, they're seeing absenteeism. In the manufacturing world, there is obviously the need to have a job and earn an income, but these workers may need to take leave due to sickness or to care for sick family members. They may be having challenges with caring for children while schools are closed. I know personally for myself, um, my husband is in law enforcement and is a first responder actively working every day. And so I am home with two kids and I get up super early so that I can get my uh, work from home or work in the evening after everyone's gone to sleep. And then I'm also balancing all these things like teaching school and things can be a little overwhelming. So you may see workers wanting to stay home and really become more insular and take care of what's most important to them, their families. And you can understand that there's a lot of fear right now. Um, you also may have workers who need to socially distance because the risk of them contracting the disease is so great because they care for immunocompromised family members. I know this was one of the reasons why I was very eager to start working from home or working remotely um, because I helped my mom take care of my dad who is has been sick for a very long time. So making sure that you're protecting your family members may be another reason why workers may not be around and um, calling out sick. Other things you may experience for your business are changes in commerce. Commerce patterns change um, based off of the economy and a variety of other factors. But right now what we're seeing is changes in commerce being affected by demand for items. What does your business provide right now? You should be asking yourself that. And is what you provide actually an essential service that is helping us fight this invisible um, war as it's being spoken of in the news? Um, or could you shift to something that's needed to actually combat the outbreak? So that's something from a business side you need to be thinking about. And then also thinking about it from the perspective of inter interrupted supply and delivery. <clears throat> Will you be able to get the supplies you need? Are there going to be other suppliers further upstream to you that will stop functioning and then suddenly you'll find yourself unable to get certain things that you need for manufacturing processes or have you already experienced these disruptions? The, these are some of the things that we're taking a look at. So the reason why we're making this video now is because the Georgia Tech MEP program, which stands for Manufacturing Extension Program, 
and the Georgia Tech OSHA consultation program, which is a free program that provides, um, which is a program which is federally funded by OSHA with a state match. And um, we provide free on site compliance assistance to small businesses. So our two programs are partnering together to really help companies um, think through the process of how they can continue manufacturing, if they should continue manufacturing, and how do they survive this global pandemic. So we're going to be looking at some key strategy areas for infectious disease preparedness and response plan, which this is a type of plan that you really should be sitting down and working on putting together. It would include a risk assessment, so looking at which jobs um, are most important for workers, and if you had an absence in those key critical positions, what would happen? Also looking at reducing the risk of employee exposure. We are looking at um, strategies related to each aspect of the plan. How can you get employees involved? Are employees involved in this planning process? Um, what community connections should you be speaking with? Do you know how to get in, in touch with your local health department? Do you know how to get in touch with your local um, government? And who do you contact if you need extra supplies or you need extra support? And then how can you prevent this from being something that totally shuts down your business? Um, we were speaking with a company not too long ago where they were really frightened about losing this one key individual who they didn't have anyone to backfill that position. And so um, they were desperately fearful that he might not be able to come into work. And that is a key element that your companies need to be thinking about. Are there ways you need to be cross-training individuals, thinking about how to have duplicity in your actions so that business can continue? And then reviewing and updating these plans as things change. As of right now, I am recording this on March 30th, 2020. And every day with this pandemic, things are changing. So you need to make sure that you are constantly um, reaching out and seeing if there's any new information. So what are the steps you can take right now to reduce a worker's risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2? And it's sometimes referred to as SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. And um, those are just two different names that are given to this outbreak, but they both are referring to the same thing. Um, the first thing is you want to develop an infectious disease and preparedness and response plan. And to do that, you need to think of where, how, and to what sources um, workers might be exposed. And it's really taking into account that your workers go home every night at the end of the day. They may be interacting with the public. They may be interacting with customers. They have coworkers that they may be standing near and interacting with throughout the day, having lunch with, going out to a sandwich shop with, um, <clears throat> or they may be taking care of sick individuals. Then you want to be thinking any of any non-occupational risk factors at home or in the community and how that may impact what happens in your place of business. So are there um, community events that are still taking place where you are that are potentially putting your employees at risk of being exposed to the virus? And then are there workforce, workforce individual risk factors? Is your workforce comprised of people of a specific age? Do they have pre-existing medical conditions? Are they potentially immunocompromised? Um, are they pregnant? There's a variety of different factors that may put them at increased risk of being exposed to the virus. And um, a lot of this is challenging because me as an industrial hygienist, I'm looking at workplace safety and health, but I am not the person to be answering questions when it comes to HIPAA or other items. So when you think of question number four, what controls can be implemented to control these risks? You also have to be thinking to yourself, who should be at the table when you're making this plan? And who should be involved with these controls? Do you have an occupational health nurse that works at your company? Do you have a legal team? Do you have other um, HR professionals at your place of business that may be able to assist with having these discussions and dialogues? 
Now, as an industrial hygienist, I always think about working, reducing workplace exposure by first thinking of the hierarchy of controls. Um, when we think about that, we think of elimination, and that's physically removing the hazard. Now, when we're looking at it from the perspective of a virus, that's really hard. You can't just completely eliminate all potential risk for the hazard unless you're able to work remotely. So, first and foremost, you should be thinking about all of the employees who are either non-essential or essential and their work can be done from a remote location and how you can get them out of the workplace and into their homes where they'll be safe and physically removed from the hazard itself. The next thing is you need to think about work practice controls. And these are procedures for safe and proper work that can be used to reduce the duration or frequency or intensity of exposure to a hazard. So. The biggest one and the biggest work practice control that you have seen, um, whether or not you recognize that it is a practice control, is social distancing. And by that, I mean creating additional space between the workers so that we're working six feet apart instead of right next to shoulder to shoulder to the person. So, basically, what you should be thinking to yourself is if my employees put their arms out and spread them out, would their fingertips be touching each other? Because an arm is about roughly two and a half feet, and if another arm, another two and a half feet, so that's about five feet. So if you're able to touch fingertips, you are well inside of that six foot range. And you wanna be thinking about how you can rearrange where people are standing to increase that distance. The next thing you want to be thinking about are administrative controls, and this may include um, in controlling employees exposure by scheduling their work tasks in a certain way to minimize their exposure levels. Something might be as such as staggering the work shifts so that people that are doing certain tasks only come into the manufacturing plant during a certain period of time, or if you were running two shifts run three smaller shifts so that there's fewer people at any time in the building. And then the final last resort is looking at personal protective equipment. And this includes clothing and other work-related accessories that can help create a barrier against this workplace, ha workplace hazard. And for here, we're thinking about COVID-19 or the virus. Now, other steps that employers can do to redu reduce workers' exposure risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is you also need to do things like consider revising your sick leave policy or not requiring a sick note from a doctor. These two items are critically important because many times, especially if there is a point system or um, employees have limited amount of sick leave, they may try to power through and come into work anyway, even if they aren't feeling so well because they're fearful of losing their job. So you really want to make this sick leave policy conducive to people not coming in if they're not feeling well. And not requiring a doctor's note is important because our infrastructure in the healthcare system is overwhelmed right now. So anytime we can take some of the pressure off that healthcare system so that they can better and more accurately take care of those who are critically ill, we're doing a little bit of a help in fighting this global pandemic. I already mentioned staggering the work shifts, but then you could also think about downsizing your operations. If you make three, four, five, six different items, can you think of maybe two or three of those items that may be critically important at this current moment and then downsizing to appropriately accommodate those manufacturing processes? Social distancing at work is not just so that you're not standing um, close to each other while you're working on the production line, but also really getting um, in the employees' minds that you're not doing pre shift um, toolbox talks and all standing around together, that you're not having lunch together or congregating together, thinking about all those different locations and places during work that we as a society, I mean, and it's really hard because we enjoy spending time with each other, but really helping and assisting people find a way to create that distance and making it the norm for the time being.
And then you want to think about cross training workers. I already mentioned this a little bit earlier, but one of the companies that we are working with is in panic mode because they have, they don't have the depth they need to continue operations. Um, and there's 2 different things. There's having the ability to continue operations. Um, if you're just trying to stay open and stay in business, and then there's the alternate of if you are making something that is critically important, like manufacturing of respirators, how are you going to be able to deliver this surge service where you need to get so much more done without exhausting or potentially harming your workforce? Again, we always want to make sure that we're protecting our most valuable asset, our employees. So in my office, we have this phrase and we're stealing it from Brene Brown. I don't know if you've ever read any of her books, but she is um, <clears throat> really amazing when it comes to communication and being a good leader and so many different things. She's a scientist, a researcher, but she has this phrase, phrase that we use all the time and it's called clear is kind. And when you think about it, it's probably the number one issue that we are suffering from right now, because we are being bombarded with information from all different locations and all different sectors. We log on to our phones and we have news stories telling us how bad things are. We have um, competing news outlets telling us different sides of a story. Um, we have people who are circulating information and a lot of misinformation on social networking platforms, such as Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And um, there's a lot of information to digest and we're sometimes overwhelmed with information. And the other aspect of that is that sometimes in the vacuum of information, people will fill it in with their own ideas of what they think is going to happen. So, for the sake of your business, it is really critically important as um, whenever you have a public health crisis such as this is to really take active steps to make sure that you're including all of your employees and that includes your um, office workers, your manufacturing workers, your temporary labor, your contractors from all the different types of workers and that you are clearly communicating a message to them that allows them to know what you guys know and what your plans are. So there's a couple basic steps with any emergency to follow. Step one is to designate a communications coordinator. And so this is the person that's really going to be essential and mission critical to your business and making sure that whatever you're communicating whatever policies and procedures you're adopting um, are not only accurate, but legal and also appropriate for your business. So those are really critically important. And then also making sure that they are translated to be presented in a way that is easily understandable by your workforce. This is increasingly challenging if you're working in a place of business where there is more than one language spoken. Please be aware that Things can and will get lost in translation. The next thing you need to do is designate a spokesperson. And this spokesperson is really going to be the person who is readily available to communicate with newspapers, um, family members, anybody who may potentially want to interact with your place of business is ready and willing and able to be the spokesperson for your manufacturing plant. And then the next thing you need to do for step three is identify communication needs. And this is going to include things like identifying a target audience. Think about what your goals are and those goals may be different based off of different audiences. Um, you know, ever since this outbreak has occurred and came to the US, um, I have gotten an email from every single company I have ever purchased something from online with their communicating to me how they are going to take care of my needs so that I can buy stuff, right? And you've probably experienced something very similar. So I think we are doing a pretty good job telling our clients or who are customers what we're doing to keep their needs being met. 
but what you may not be doing such a great job at, um, or you may need to actively work on is communicating to all the different individuals in your plant and also your suppliers and other um, vendors that you may be interacting with, or maybe community um, people within the community to say how your company is responding. All of these different things need to be um, pulled together and communicated in slightly different manners. And then you also need to decide, are there target materials that are needed do you need to create an app for your employees so that your employees can log on and instantly see how your employee your company is responding or do you need to create a card for all employees to carry to know what to do um, if they start feeling ill um, those are things that you need to be thinking about then you have to create a plan so not only do you need an infectious disease prevention plan, but you also need a communication plan to go with that. And you're going to think about things like information dissemination channels. You know, my brother was at Virginia Tech when the shooting happened. And one of the things that all universities recognized when that happened, and I recognized and my family recognized, and thankfully he was fine, was that communication sometimes in times of crises becomes really challenging. And so now as a university employee at Georgia Tech, we have what's called the G10s, um, where if anything happens, whether it's very mundane or very traumatic, um, we're getting text messages and phone calls giving us updates. And they go to all individuals and employees. And you've probably noticed this as well, that this is something that your, um, if you have children, your children's schools have adopted as well. So I get text messages from my daughter's middle school, my younger daughter's elementary school. I get stuff from Georgia Tech. I'm constantly being fed information about how each organization or institution is responding. So that's one thing you need to be thinking about is how best in this time of social distancing can you disseminate that information and ensure that it gets to all your employees. One location we came across is that um, they were emailing that information, but not all the manufacturing employees at the plant had email addresses. So a lot of people were being missed by that information. The next thing you need to think about is how you are going to work with the media eventually, especially if somebody tests positive at your plant, they are going to call you and say, what are you doing? So you should have all of that pre-planned and already written on the steps you're going to take if and when something happens. And you want to prepare these announcements and establish update procedures. How often are you going to update? Are you going to update employees on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, those, those items, and then prepare talking points. And then finally, the fifth step is to monitor this information flow and gauge the response. It's really important that you look to see if anything is misinterpreted or really confusing. And um, there's lots of different ways that just by talking it out with individuals, you can start really seeing how you can make a clear and kinder message so that people get it the first time. And that's why it's so important to have employees involved in this process. I do want to share with you a couple resources. Um, there is a National Institute of Health report that was compiled after the H1N1 pandemic influenza outbreak. Um, I'm not sure if it was classified ever as a pandemic, but there was a global in influenza epidemic. And um, this research article kind of summarizes what they learned um, that would help better communicate during a time of crisis like that. And then in practice, um, that next link is a way, and it's really amazing PDF document that gives you pandemic influenza leadership tools. And even though they're specific to influenza, the communication, it's all about tools when there is an outbreak of a virus. How do you respond? And how does that differ from something like a tornado or an earthquake or some other tragedy? And then finally, the World Health Organization has a really great risk communication training module. And 
I sometimes go back and reference it because it's a really great tool to remind myself on how to be clear in my messaging when it comes to public health. Another step that all employees can take, and I know that you've heard this ad nauseum by watching the news and everything that you've encountered, but you really need to make sure and actively monitor to make sure that there is promoting frequent hand washing for customers, visitors, um, and the workers, most importantly. And then also educating about respiratory etiquette. I can't tell you how many times I've been watching news conferences when people are still coughing in their hands. Um, just ask a, some kid what a dab is, and that's how you should be coughing. You're dabbing, you're putting your, hand, your face into um, your elbow and coughing in there. You also want to make sure there's adequate trash receptacles for tissues, gloves, any um, anything disposable that needs to be disposed of. That's something that I noticed the last time I went to the grocery store is there were discarded gloves on the ground and um, or easy fix fix for a business, even though those customers should not be just, just discarding them on the ground. One easy fix is to have a trash receptacle there so that people can throw things away instead of leaving it on the ground for somebody to pick up at a later date. And then the next thing is I really want you to start thinking about who uses other people's workstations because that is going to be the contamination um, when people are touching surfaces and potentially being exposed because of shared work surfaces. So thinking about that, we need to be thinking about policies and procedures for the prompt identification and isolation of sick people and when they start feeling like they may be susceptible to the disease. And this includes of thinking of ways to isolate them if they come to you and they start feeling ill while they're at work and how you will get them out of your building and to the appropriate healthcare facility. <clears throat> and where they should go and this is where communicating with local public health officials. Um, your potentially your workers comp provider to get some better guidance on how you should handle it within your business. Um, also, employers should inform and encourage employees to self monitor for signs of COVID-19. Um, there are lots of different guidance for that. Um, we also can share with you if you have a meeting with us, which is one of the options we have um, the different guidance. If you want to do active monitoring where you're taking the temperature of employees. And then you have to think about policies and procedures for employees to report when they're sick or experiencing symptoms. Can they call in? Do they text in? Who do they text? Who does the person that they text have to tell? Like all of this needs to be determined and figured out. And then making sure that contractors and temp agencies are following these same procedures. Um, for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be referring to surfaces or contaminated objects as fomites, because that's what we use. The term we use in the public health field is a fomite is a surface that is, has been contaminated by a virus or a bacteria. And what you find is that if people are breathing or coughing, um, they can contaminate a surface and then somebody comes behind them and touches that same surface. And then the other image is showing how airborne viruses can transfer from person to person if you're in close contact. So some information from the Centers for Disease Control that they're recommending for employers to do is first and foremost, actively encouraging any employee that's showing any signs or symptoms to stay home. That is, employees who have symptoms of the virus, which includes fever, cough, and shortness of breath, should notify their supervisor and not come into work. Also, sick employees should follow the CDC recommended steps and should not return to work until they have met the criteria to discontinue home isolation. So these are different items that are included in a link I'm going to share. Um, but this is really important because they're finding and they are beginning to think that a lot of the transmission of the disease is by asymptomatic people um, or by people that are still shedding the virus and potentially causing that spread. Employees who are well but have a sick family member at home with COVID-19 should notify their supervisor and there are CDC recommended precautions. This is really important. Employees have to feel safe and comfortable enough 
with you to be able to call you and let you know that they have a sick family member, because if they're taking care of a sick family member and you can't quarantine that person and have them self quarantine at home and instead they're coming into work, they could potentially contaminate your entire workforce. And that could be really tragic and um, cause a lack of con continuity for your business. Um, you also might want to identify where and how workers might be exposed at work. Um, they have OSHA has guidance on their web page on how to protect workers with a potential exposure and then also guidance for employees um, that includes special steps you can take um, for jobs according to that exposure risk. You also need to be aware that some employees may be at higher risk for serious illness. Um, and we've gone over some of those items, but you may want to consider minimizing face to face contact between these employees or assign them different work tasks that allow them to maintain a distance of at least six feet away from other workers, um, customers, or potentially to consider teleworking or working from home if possible. And then finally, according to the CDC guidance, you need to separate those workers. So anyone who's appearing to have symptoms. Um, upon arrival to work um, should immediately be separated and then sent home. And if that employee is confirmed to have a COVID-19 infection, this is really critically important and probably the most important sentence I'm going to say today. Employers should inform fellow employees of their possible exposure in the workplace while still maintaining confidentiality as required by the Americans with Disability Act and then follow the fellow employees should then self-monitor for symptoms. This is the link um, for that guidance for business response. It's incredibly helpful and it has lots of links to other information as well. The next thing that we get a lot of questions from companies about is how to prepare to implement basic inf infection prevention measures. When we're looking at how persistent the coronavirus is on surfaces, um, we're just beginning to see studies about how long it lasts. Um, on wood, they are seeing that it might last up to four days, steel for 48 hours, um, plastic five days, paper four to five days. I think cardboard, I had read that it's lasting about 24 hours. So various lengths of time on different surfaces. The Washoe County Health District um, made this really helpful infographic for cleaning for COVID-19. Um, and it kind of goes through step by step, but I like what their main points are, which is to clean, sanitize, and wait. The waiting is the most important part. For effective sanitization, you have to wait for the proper contact time to take place, as indicated by the product label. And we'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. How do you disinfect? First, you have to close off the areas that were used by the sick person. And I want you to not just think about the desk that they were using, but think about how they walked into the facility, the places that they would go throughout their day, all the surfaces that they might touch. You really want to think about all the different areas where they might work. Open outside doors and windows. If possible, shut down operations and wait 24 hours or as long as possible before cleaning because you really want to make sure that the workers that are performing the cleaning are properly educated, trained, and prepared um, to clean and disinfect all those areas that were used by the sick person. You also need to be thinking about other surfaces like forklift seats and wheels, break rooms, microwaves, fridges, anything else that that employee may have come in contact with while they were infectious. Um, also, when you're disinfecting surfaces, you need to make sure you're wearing disposable gloves when cleaning and disinfecting surfaces. And anytime you take off gloves, as soon as you take off the gloves, you immediately have to wash your hands following with following standard hand washing procedures. Um, one thing I want to point out is if you are going to be using bleach solutions, which is commonly what most people would be using, or alcohol solutions with at least 70% alcohol, um, <clears throat> diluted household bleach solutions should be done by taking five tablespoons or a third of a cup of bleach per gallon of water or using four teaspoons of bleach per quart of water. One thing you should be aware of, though, is this solution is not stable. So once you make it, you need to dispose of it after a 24 hour period and make a fresh batch daily. So you don't wanna just make a spray bottle full of a bleach solution and use it for the next several weeks because it'll lose its effectiveness. 
The other thing you want to be thinking about is making sure that every object, um, every type of disinfectant you're using is an EPA registered household or commercially available disinfectant. And then for soft porous surfaces, such as carpeted floors, rugs, drapes, you want to remove any visible contamination and then look for how you can clean it with appropriate cleaners. Now, one thing I wanted to point out is that if you want to find out what is an EPA registered disinfectant, you go to the EPA website. List N is dedicated to emerging viral pathen pathogens and also um, the human coronavirus, which is SARS COVID 2 or COVID 19. And they have a list and they also have a way you can download that information. It'll have an EPA registered disinfectant num number, so the EPA registered number, the product name. It'll also have the active ingredients, the company that manufactures it. And then what is the directions and preparation that you should follow? So some um, chemical agents will have different preparation instructions for different types of uses. So you wanna be following what they have listed for specific types of viruses. The next thing and the most important thing is not only do you have to follow the directions, but you also have to make sure it comes in contact with the surface for the appropriate amount of time. And then um, checking to make sure that viral pathogen claim is accurate. And then you can also look, they are constantly adding new chemicals. So always go back to the EPA website to see if anything new is available. The key notes about disinfection is you want to read the instructions from the manufacturer. You want to provide the PPE for employees performing disinfection and sanitation tasks. You want to do any training related to hazardous chemicals as required by OSHA under the HAZCOM standard. And then keep up to date with any changes or new recommendations that may be published or as we learn more about COVID-19. And concentration and set time are very important and will make all the difference in the world whether or not your surface is properly disinfected. Next, a little bit about personal protective equipment. You should be taking stock of what your employees must use to protect themselves from hazards. Determine if there are shortages um, expected for the needed PPE. And then also work with suppliers to determine alternate sources for PPE types for employees. So if you were using an N95, I know a lot of companies have donated their N95s to healthcare facilities you potentially could be looking at using an elastomeric respirator. Um, and the nice thing about these is they can be decontaminated and reused um, in case there are shortages of N95s as there are right now. And then you want to also be thinking about engineering controls that potentially could reduce the exposures to remove the need for the PPE anyway. Um, those are just some basic recommendations that we have. I want to highlight some OSHA guidance as well. OSHA has developed new resources and information for workers, and they have a web page um, within the OSHA website dedicated to the 2019 no novel coronavirus or um, COVID-19. And this website also includes this publication. It's called Guidance on Preparing Workplaces for COVID-19. It's really helpful. Checklist basic follow through on how your company and your place of business can prepare. They also give guidance on what existing OSHA standards protect workers from exposure. There is currently no OSHA standard for COVID-19. However, there are lots of standards that apply. First and foremost, um, employers should always remember that OSHA can use the general duty clause, which is section 5A1, which states that under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, em Act employers must ensure workers are protected from recognized safety and health hazards that may cause serious harm. Other applicable standards include personal protective equipment, um, such as PPE general requirements, eye and face protection, respiratory protection, hand protection, the bloodborne pathogen standard applies, the HAZCOM standard applies, and the record keeping standard also applies. Um, when we think about OSHA enforcement, I also want you to think about that OSHA is still actively doing enforcement. They're still going out to job sites. Um, and during emergency response operations, even when OSHA is operating in a technical assistance or support mode, 
um, the standards still remain in effect. So they, you still have to comply with the law. And enforcement of OSHA standards follows the jurisdiction in place before the emergency, such as state operating OSHA approved occupational safety and health plans called state plans. In Georgia, we do not have a state plan, so you just follow the federal guidelines. There is temporary enforcement guidance for annual fit testing for N95 masks. Um, they made an exemption so that healthcare industries do not necessarily have to comply with the fifth testing requirements. However, this only applies to the health industry. And if you are a welding shop, you still have to be following the, the requirements of the respiratory protection standard. So what are you doing? We want to know, and we want to be able to help you. We are compiling a survey to generate results to share with the Georgia manufacturing extension professional and next generation manufacturing um, to really see how the state of Georgia and manufacturing companies in our state are responding. So scan this code and you can get to the survey or you can follow the link. So do you have questions? Do you still think you might need more help? We are here for you. Um, we are available for individual conference, web-based conference calls or meetings. Um, if you would like one of those, follow the link to www.oshainfo.gotech.edu or go to the Georgia Tech MEP program website. Um, there will be a link where you can request this type of service. You will have a safety and health professional who has um, training in emergency response and public health on the call. And you will also have somebody from the Georgia Tech MEP program on the call. And we can meet with your company. It's free of charge and really help walk you through this process. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.